us this morning to the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4. The title of the message is Effective Ministry. Paul is writing to his young friend Timothy, who is the pastor of the very strong, powerful church in Ephesus. And he is giving him advice on how to use the vernacular, grow the church, grow the leaders. It's how to really see a church become all that it can and should be. He talks about the power of the church in chapter 3 in verse 14. The church is not just another organization. We all belong to organizations, schools, businesses, perhaps bowling teams, softball leagues, whatever. We had all sorts of enterprises and even our own personal families. But the church is unique. We're talking about the local fellowship. The body of Christ universal is certainly the church of God. But we're talking about coming together in the local church setting. And the Apostle Paul says in chapter 3 and verse 14 or verse 15, talking about the church, it is the house of God which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. That is awesome. Unbelievable. Talk about uh, responsibility. If I were to take that seriously upon myself, I think I'd retire before I finish a sentence. That's too much for any human being to do. To say that this is the house of God means it has to be God's house and God's work, doesn't it? It is the church of the living God. This is his people. This is where he gathers. This local fellowship, all local fellowships around the world. This is where he gathers. House churches, mega churches, small churches. And why is it important to God? Because it is the pillar and it is the ground or the foundation of the truth. If you want to be supported by God and God's word, have the foundation of God's word under you, it's going to be found primarily in the local church. Now, I'm not saying you can't love the Lord and serve the Lord by free floating out there without going to a local fellowship. But the concern here is not how do they do on their own outside, but what is our job here in the local fellowship? We've been called out, and that's what the church is. It's the ecclesia, the called out ones. And uh, we are called out to be the pillar and the ground of truth. And so with that in mind, we need to know what we're supposed to do. How are we supposed to be in that position to carry out God's task? He's going to talk about that today. He's going to talk about how to have effective ministry. All of us are ministers or servants of the Lord, and we need to know how to have effective ministries. No matter what you do, you want to be good at it, right? How many of you have jobs? You want to be effective. Not only, only two folks have jobs here. We've got to pray for them. No wonder the offerings are a little bit off here. All right. <laughs> Get time on what you don't have, right? So we need to be effective at it, right? How many are in sports? I hate to ask, how many are in sports? One or two, maybe? <laughs> uh, three are in sports. All right. The rest of you would need to get awake, all right? Uh, you want to be effective in what you're doing, right? You want to be effective, so you need to learn how to be effective. We're going to teach you today how to be effective in ministry. Three things you need to do. Number one, you need to know the Word. Number two, you need to use the Word. Number three, you need to teach the Word. It all centers around the Word of God. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for this chance to study your Word. Help us to really understand it to know it, to use it, to teach it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. First of all, he's going to talk about knowing the Word, knowing the true Word of God. In order to do that, you need to do two things. You need to avoid the false, and you need to know the true. Now that goes on for anything. You want to be a good golfer? You have to know the false, the wrong things not to do, and the, the true, the right way to do it. And so it is in anything in life. We need to know how to avoid the false and know and embrace the true. So beginning in verse 1 of chapter 4, let's talk about avoiding the false. 
Now the Spirit, or the Holy Spirit, expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Now here we know the true, verse 4. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the <coughs> word of God and prayer. Avoid the false. There are all sorts of teachings out there, supposedly in the name of the Lord. All of us have been exposed to false teachings somewhere at some time. Mm -hmm. And as you begin, you begin your study with the Lord, you get into His Word, you begin to realize how false the teaching really was. How many can say amen to that, that you had false teaching along the line? We've all had that. In the area of banking, First day on a teller's job, she gets out or he gets out a lot of fake money, right? And touches fake money? No, that's wrong. They get out real money. They begin to handle the real money. The more you handle the real money, the more you can detect that which is false. And when they can handle it enough, they can tell a beautiful counterfeit. It just doesn't feel right. So it is with God's Word. When I first got saved, I began to study the Bible, but I was listening to Christian radio morning, noon, and night. And I listened to all these teachers, again, from morning, noon, and night. And it didn't take a fifth grade education to realize there's a lot of difference of opinion on some of these points. And I said to the Lord, how do I know what's false and how do I know what's true? And the Lord said, get into the Bible and learn the true. Then you will know the false. So there's no substitute for that. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Well, let's go back to verse 1 now and break this down. Now the Spirit, or the Holy Spirit, expressly says, or He explicitly says, in latter times, some will depart from the faith. There'll be a falling away. The word depart there is the word apostasia. In the Greek, we get our word apostasy from it. Falling away from the faith. And how do you fall away from the fall of the true? By getting into the false, don't you? And so they're going to fall away from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. What is the true cause of false teaching? Not innocent mistakes, not wild imaginations of teachers, but actually demonic deceiving spirits. The devil does not want us to know his word, God's word. He does not want us to know the true, and so he will give us instead the false. And we need to be very careful about that. The devil can't stop us from getting into the Bible, but he can keep us from knowing the whole counsel of God. Can't. And so we will find here that it's a deceiving spirit, and it's a doctrine of the demons to give us false teaching. When you go back through the history of the church, and the more you study the history of the church, the more you're going to realize that there are all sorts of groups and offshoots that are just totally not of God, even those claiming to be Christian. Right now, it's probably the largest denomination in the world is so-called Christianity, meaning it's not Islamic, it's not Buddhist, it's not uh, Hindu, but it's not born again. If you want to talk about born-again Christians, studies have brought it down to as low as under 10%, some as low as 5% of professing believers are truly born again. Based on asking questions like, how are you saved? Is it by the blood of Christ? Did he die for our sins? Is there no other way to heaven but Jesus Christ? And uh, most Christians can't answer that in the right frame of mind to be born again. Well, it's going to be deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons <coughs> They're going to keep us from the true. So we need to know the source. And those demons, on their own, are far more clever than we are. Much, much smarter. More power, been around a lot longer. And unless we have Jesus Christ to enlighten us, 
and the Holy Spirit to open our eyes, we are going to be deceived. Well, these teachers who are of the devil, motivated by these demons, verse 2, are speaking lies in hypocrisy. They're not telling the truth. And they're being hypocritical. You know what it means to be hypocritical? That comes from the old uh, Greek idea of the Greek plays uh, where you would have a mask put over. They were, didn't have television in those days and video and zoom lenses and so you had to look way from the back row to see the face and you couldn't see the face of the actor. So they'd have these faces. You've seen the smiley face and the sad face representing theater. And so they put on a mask to portray the character that they wanted you to believe in. And so a hypocrite is somebody who puts on a mask. So you think you're seeing the real person and it's not who that person really is. Well, these false teachers are putting on the mask of teaching you the truth, and it's a lie. They have their own conscience seared with a hot iron. They're hypocrites and they are hardened. To have your conscience seared, what is a conscience first of all? Conscience is something within us, it's a moral judge, isn't it? It's a moral arbiter that tells you right from wrong. It's not your spiritual nature. Your spiritual new man in Christ is pure and 100% of God. The conscience, though, is something that everybody has, born again or not, atheist or agnostic or believer. But it's our own sense of what's right and wrong, and it's the best we have apart from Christ coming in and giving us new life. And these fellows have their consciences. They don't have a born-again spirit, to be sure. But they have a conscience of what's right and wrong. But their conscience, through continual sin and turning from God's way, has made the conscience seared. What does it mean to be seared? It's cauterized. It means to, what do you do? You take a flame to something, like flesh. They'll do this in the hospital sometimes. If it's dangerous, they'll... Uh, the wound is open, they'll cauterize it, and um, they'll, they'll burn it, and they'll try to get it to close up, which incidentally causes so much bacterial problems, it is just a tragedy in the waiting most of the time with cauterization, that's another story. But it's been seared, and once it's seared, you have no sensation in that area. So when your conscience is seared, you don't have any sensitivity, you don't even know right from wrong anymore. So these fellows have been doing this so long, verse 2, as hypocrites, conscience is so seared, they get off into this teaching which is simply not of God. So verse 3 gives you an example of what they're teaching. Now Paul is dealing with people who are teachers of the law of Moses, and they still push the law of Moses, not realizing Jesus Christ has fulfilled the law. And the way to please God is not by keeping the law, but embracing Christ. They also took that Jewish law and they mixed it with Eastern asceticism. Asceticism, depriving yourself of a lot of things with the idea that if I deprive myself, I'm becoming pure. Pious. And here's an example of how we're going to deprive ourselves. Forbidding to marry. Not allowed to marry. You're going to be a priest. You're going to be a leader of a flock. You are not to marry. Because, first of all, that's a sign of piety. Devoting yourself totally to the work of the Lord. And so, therefore, no priest is going to be able to marry. That was a problem back in his time. Is that a problem today? 